Thank you for the invitation to speak. I have no financial disclosures, but I do have a clinical uh, disclosure, and that is you don't get invited to speak about anastomotic leak uh, until you've had a few anastomotic leaks, and then you get to a point where no one invites you anymore because you've had too many anastomotic leaks. So at this point, I'm trying to shift this curve to the right. Outline of my discussion, I, I will discuss uh, definitions, diagnostic strategies, and then management, of course, and then uh, pay attention to symptomatic clinical leaks as well as asymptomatic patients. So let's begin with definitions, and Professor Golliger really got us going uh, with a better understanding of clinical versus subclinical leaks uh, several years ago. In this uh, study that uh, looked at one versus two layered anastomoses, all patients had a water-soluble contrast study after the anastomosis. And you can see, and we're, we're focused on TME here today, so I'll just look at the lower line there. For the level of the anastomosis when it was low, there were substantially more imaging leaks than there were clinical leaks. So there were a large <coughs> number of patients with subclinical leaks. Obviously, this is important to us because we have, an, uh, our patients after TME are often diverted. And we showed this with a study that we published a couple of years ago uh, looking at time to presentation of patients uh, after construction of their anastomosis. We had a reasonable rate of anastomotic leak after diverted uh, anastomoses uh, within 30 days of about 5%. These are challenging uh, anastomoses, very low to the um, anus. And what we saw, however, were there were almost twice as many leaks that occurred after 30 days. And there are many reasons for this. One, of course, patients are diverted and there was no contents to pass through the anastomotic defect. And the other thought is that potentially with these extra peritoneal anastomoses that are so low down that the tissues are not innervated down at that level and that potentially the patients are not uh, uh, experiencing the usual signs and symptoms that you would see with a clinical leak that was in the peritoneum. There are, of course, classic signs and symptoms of clinical leak. This is a paper that was published by my partners at MGH a few years back that showed that fever, pain, nausea were the three most common signs and symptoms that patients experience with an anastomotic leak, but also pay attention to the patient who is not diuresing normally after surgery, and then I would say also patients who have or experience urinary retention, I worry about potentially uh, uh, a fluid cavity or of some sort near the bladder uh, or the urethra. Also, it's important to remember that many of these patients are asymptomatic. This is a picture of a small defect, a sinus tract at the anastomosis. And again, I will state that there's a large number of patients who have absolutely no clinical signs, but have these small little sinuses or cavities near their anastomosis. There are, of course, our usual imaging modalities in diagnosing anastomotic leak. Contrast enema is routinely used, and we're looking for extravasation, as you see on the diagram there are on the picture. And then of course, CAT scan, which I prefer, which not only would show us extravasation if rectal contrast is infused, but also other uh, findings such as a fluid collection, ischemia, or even uh, signs of obstruction on the images. However, there are mixed results of imaging. This is a list of studies looking at the sensitivity and specificity of imaging tests for CAT scan and water soluble contrast study. And as you can see, fairly poor results with sensitiv sensitivities ranging from about 12% to 90% uh, for either CAT scan or water soluble uh, studies, but much better specificities for both types of tests. So what I'd say is that the authors found that there was substantial inner observer variability, particularly if multiple radiologists were looking at the images and that we are not able to identify all the leaks uh, with these imaging tests. Important findings on CT imaging, extra luminal contrast, of course, is uh, uh, an important finding, but also free air, uh, perianastomotic air, perianastomotic fluid, particularly when it's beyond five or six days after surgery. Of course, there's usually some air or fluid near the anastomosis initially, but beyond five or six days is when I start to be more concerned. Uh, there have been studies looking at the, dis at the staple line, whether or not it was disrupted, and that does not seem to correlate with anastomotic leak. Other important findings to look for, the double rectum sign, that's a anastomosis 
that looks like it is in the uh, an island within a uh, air bubble. Uh, the air bubble itself is thought to be the uh, rectum, but it is not indeed. It is just air outside the anastomosis. And then, of course, air in fluid near an anastomosis, particularly when there is contrast in that uh, fluid. Given the mixed imaging results, there's been more and more work with C-reactive protein, and there have been several studies published, and of course, a systematic review of about 2,400 patients in seven studies. And what the uh, authors found is that there was utility of C-reactive protein, particularly after post-op day two, between days three and seven. That's where you start to see some divergence of the mean CRP levels for patients who had no complications versus those who had an anastomotic leak, uh, the black dots there on the, on the um, uh, graph. They gave us some CRP cutoffs, but I would caution you to say that each hospital likely would have different cutoffs, as we found with our data. And then I will also say to you that although uh, m many of these studies included TME patients, remember that if the patient's diverted, it's not likely that we'll see a rise in that CRP uh, or differences in that CRP very early on in their stay. So obviously there's no perfect test and it really comes down to considering all the available data and your index of suspicion. I have to say that I tend to be fairly aggressive and I'll look with my uh, flexible scope of, at, um, if I'm concerned about a patient in any way. And for those who say, well, then you might disrupt your anastomosis, I would argue then you haven't made your anastomosis well enough. Which leads us to a definition, a consensus definition in grading for anastomotic leak that was provided to us uh, by the International Study Group of Rectal Cancer, rectal cancer specialists who came together to give us some consensus standards. And the definition was a defect of the intestinal wall at the anastomotic site leading to communication between intra and extraluminal compartments. They also gave us a grading system, grade A, no change in the management. A grade B leak is a therapeutic in intervention was needed, but no laparotomy. And grade C is a patient who needed laparotomy. And they found that these grades, when they tested uh, the uh, grading system, uh, across a group of patients, uh, another cohort of patients, they found that they were associated with outcomes, so they validated this grading system. And we'll use this grading system to come up with a management uh, algorithm for extraperitoneal leak. First, of course, controlling sepsis and re reducing bacterial load, as well as bowel rest, is, uh, are important uh, aspects of the management of these patients. For patients with sepsis or peritonitis, the unstable patient with grade C leak, I take these patients to the OR and I look at their anastomosis with a flexible scope. If there's a major defect or ischemia of the anastomosis, that patient gets an, a Hartman. If there's a minor defect, I generally can repair this, particularly if there's no chronic abscess cavity at that site. I make sure that the patient is diverted and I often um, uh, will drain them if there is a, an abscess at that site. For the stable patient who's asymptomatic, uh, or has low-grade fevers, grade A or grade B, if there's a, a phlegmon or a small abscess, I will treat them with antibiotics. If there's a loculated abscess not communicating with the anastomosis, then interventional radiology is my way to go. If either of these types of patients start to worsen, I re-image them and again make sure my diversion is working. If the abscess enters the defect, then there are a number of transanal approaches that I will discuss as well will be discussed later. If there's a sinus cavity without any symptoms, then I generally will wait. If the patient has any local uh, symptoms of any sort, then I will do something locally at the site of the anastomosis. So again, a stable patient with leak, there are a number of approaches now to, to controlling the abscess cavity. IR drains for the abscess that's not communicating with the anastomosis has been historically what we've been uh, uh, taught to do. But if the abscess is communicating with the anastomosis, then I generally do something transanally, and I think you'll hear more about endospudges and so forth in the next talk. There is a new technique or a newer technique of endoluminally draining the abscess, particularly if the anastomosis is further away from the uh, dentate line uh, and you don't want a uh, pezzer uh, emanating from the uh, patient's anus where the drain is actually placed across the defect but 
the drainage occurs within the lumen of the bowel, and these are endoscopically placed drains. They're very nice. They work very nicely for higher anastomotic leaks. The management conundrum really comes with our asymptomatic patients who have chronic cavities or have a sinus. The the x-ray or the imaging study there, the top image shows us a leak outside the anastomosis, but if, as you scroll down on these images, you'll see that the actual cavity communicates with the anastomosis. So this is just a chronic cavity, and that patient was asymptomatic. Similarly, next to that is a small sinus, again, that I showed you earlier at the anastomotic site. My practice with these is if this is early on after surgery, I try to repair it. If there is an abscess, however, I try to drain it. If it is later on, I will clip the area or cure it, depending on what it looks like, or I take no action if it's really later on and I wait. And of course, that involves a fair amount of patience. So I'll conclude by saying that the detection methods for an astomotic leak certainly need to improve. The imaging accuracy is variable. It's important, of course, that we are aggressive about managing the septic complications, particularly in our grade C patients. Those septic and toxic patients need to go right to the OR. There are a number of transanal techniques that are now available for the management of anastomotic leaks, and patience is needed for the asymptomatic patient with a sinus or a cavity. Thank you.